Thanks everyone for joining. So my talk is API security through external attack service management. So the first time I gave this talk was at the API Secure Conference back in April. It was Alyssa Knight's conference is like the first API security conference. So I was trying to find a topic to, to do for an API security conference because I've pen tested some APIs, but not an API expert. So I picked something around that area that I thought might be useful. So a little bit about myself. I'm uh, the hacker in residence at SciCognito. I'm an offensive security professional and instructor. So I've been pen testing for a little over 10 years. Former adjunct instructor at Dallas College. I taught ethical hacking and web app pen testing there for almost four years. And I'm the concept creator and co author of the pen tester blueprint. So this was based on louder. Okay. So this was based on my first lecture of the class each semester which ended up turning into a conference talk and then turned into a book so i was featured in the tribe hackers red team book and this is where i got approached to write the book because wiley publishing said you asked do you have any book ideas would you be interested to write your book and so i thought it'd be a good idea for a book i'm also the host of the hacker factory podcast and several several folks in here have actually been in that podcast and uh so it's really great for those that are wanting to get into the industry. So if you have someone you know that's wanting to get started, that's a good place for them to uh, to start out and just kind of learn about some of the other people in industries, their stories, and how they got in. And I'm also a founder of a DEF CON group in Denton, Texas, uh, DC 940. And I founded the Pwn School Project, which my Denton uh, meetings were kind of rebranded as a DEF CON group. So the agenda today is going to be defining attack surface management, prioritizing the external attack surface, risky protocols and services, and this is going to include API exposures, uh, discovering attack surfaces, API pen testing and tools, and addressing the gaps with external attack surface management. So for those just getting in the industry, I like to share my story because if a former meathead uh, pro wrestler could be a pen tester than anyone else can as well. So when I graduated high school, I didn't know what I wanted to do for a living. Never thought I would ever uh, use my mind for a living. And so this is kind of how I got in. Uh, I went to a trade school to be a CAD drafter, found out about sysadmin work. That was more interesting than what I did. Moved over to that area. As a sysadmin, I found, about, found out about InfoSec. Uh, got moved into the AppSec team where I found out about pen testing. And so uh, I got laid off from my job of almost 14 years and decided to apply for a job. Uh, Verizon was looking for consultants to do penetration testing. And fortunately, the hiring manager uh, took, a, took a chance on me because I had some vulnerability scanning experience, security experience, and a sysadmin background. I didn't have the hacking skills that I needed, but he took a chance. And one of the things I like to tell anyone, if you're trying to break into the other areas of the industry, Go for it and apply because you never know when you're going to talk to that person that's going to give you a break. Don't limit yourself. So, I know a lot of you are probably established professionals, but I like to share that just in case there's somebody, someone in the room new that's uh, just trying to break into the industry, just getting started down their path. So, to get down to business, so attack surface management, uh, to understand the attack surface, uh, we must first define attack surface. So, according to NIST, this is the point. Points on a boundary of a system, system element, or environment where an attacker can try to enter, cause an effect on, extract data from that system, system element, or environment. And just kind of the plainly kind of defined attack surface. These are the attacks, the attack vectors in that environment. And so the importance of attack service management, it assesses security from a threat actor perspective. It's hard to assess and secure what you don't know about. So if you don't know about these assets, you know, companies, a lot of times asset inventory is a, a, a big problem. And I know like for, for the internal piece, HD Moore came out with this tool, Rumble, which I think is rebranded now, that finds the internal attack surface, which is sometimes a problem, but a little less difficult internally. And so penetration testing once or twice a year, your reoccurring vulnerability scans is, is not enough for your attack surface management, managing that attack surface. And threat actors are constantly scanning the internet looking for vulnerabilities to exploit. You know, not everyone, it's not always a nation state, it could be script kitties. Threat actors on all levels are out there looking for a way in. You know, you may be 
uh, you know, they're looking, they're not always looking for the most difficult things, you know, not everyone's John Hammond and a, a CTF ninja that they're going for the difficult ways in. Uh, pen testers are trying to, I mean, not pen testers, but threat actors are trying to work smarter, not harder. So it's constantly being tested. So you need to be able to, to keep up with that attack surface. So as far as like reducing, so this is an interesting stat here from, from CISA. It's kind of a blurb of this uh, PDF, but CISA has this uh, PDF on reducing significant risks of known exploited vulnerabilities. And one of the little blurbs from there, they were talking about some different uh, vulnerabilities and that were being exploited. A uh, fix or a patch was released for one of those vulnerabilities. And then within a, a small amount of time, threat actors were already exploiting that. So it says this one paragraph I'll share with you here is also many vulnerabilities classified as critical are highly complex and have uh, never been seen exploited in the wild. In fact, 4% of the total number of CVEs have been, public, have been publicly exploited. But the threat actors are extremely fast to exploit the vulnerabilities of choice. Of those 4% known exploited CVEs, 42% are being used on uh, zero days on disclosed on zero day disclosure, 50% within two days, 75% within 20 days, 28 days. Meanwhile, the CVSS score of these are, are, are medium or even low. And some of these are being stringed together in different attacks. Different lower level vulnerabilities are being strung together to get access. So this just kind of shows why we need to really be monitoring our attack surface, constantly testing, constantly monitoring for the, our changing attack surface. So attack surface management addresses both internal and external facing systems. While both are important, our focus here is going to be on the external attack surface. You know, you've seen stats. One of the latest stats I saw a few years ago was most threats or, you know, most attacks or breaches are 60% or something like that is internal. But the thing is, the, the external attack surface is more accessible globally. You don't have to be within a certain distance to try to, to break in via Wi-Fi, be an insider threat. But the external attack surface is constantly being probed and, and people are constantly trying to break in. Anyone that has their own website and you've kind of monitored your logs on the failed logins, you get to see just exactly how often people are trying to attack your site. And you may be just, it may just be a blog and you'll be amazed. I mean, uh, I used to be a webmaster for our church website and it was amazed, amazing how many people were trying to, to break in from all around the world. And so a lot of times you're not monitoring, you just don't really understand, you know, how many threat actors are trying to actually get into your system. And then you take well-known companies where there's some kind of motivation behind uh, breaching that company, then you're going to have even, a, you know, a lot more activity. So some of the elements of attack surface management is vulnerability scanning, vulnerability assessments and pen testing, red teaming, uh, and here I'm referring to adversary emulation. Purple teaming, bug bounties. So bug bounties have been something in purple teaming or been newer advancements in attack service management, but very valuable methods to use. But the purple teaming is mainly from the internal perspective, but I wanted to make sure to cover, cover here the different elements of attack service management. Application security and testing integrated into your software development lifecycle is kind of more companies are starting to, to involve that instead of trying to secure things after the fact or pen testing and then going fixing uh, these problems after things have been deployed into production. So companies are getting better about that. So some of the traditional attack service management gaps, one of the things that, that compliance pen testing has done, especially like PCI, it's brought around the need for more pen testing. When I was getting started in pen testing back in 2012, PCI was just starting to come about. Pen testing for PCI started to become more popular. And a lot of people started having pen tests done basically just for compliance. But what that did at the same time is this narrow scope. So people are focusing on PCI and neglecting these other environments. You may be able to breach other environments and gain access to uh, you know, PII, uh, credit card data, and all sorts of information is valuable, but these areas are being overlooked. The amount of time spent on it because the budgets are so small, uh, lack of resources internally to do that. So the time and resources limit limitations. So is it, you know, 
some companies can't afford to have consultants completely do it, so they have internal resources doing this testing. But a lot of cases, a lot of cases, no matter how you're doing this, a mixture of uh, consulting, internal resources, bug bounties, and that sort of thing. It's just sometimes there's just not enough time to do that. So in a, incomplete and inaccurate asset inventories are sometimes a problem. Uh, when I was a red team lead at a global consumer products company, we outsourced our web app pen testing and we've, we used some bug bounty companies and we've used consulting companies. But before we perform those web app pen tests, we had to go through working with the dev team to collect all the URLs. We weren't aware of all the apps that we had. So uh, if you don't know these assets, it's kind of hard to test those and protect them. You know, the developers that are working this may know about it, but some cases applications are impl implemented into environments and it's not known by security. So it's not in being pen tested, you know, part of their vulnerability scanning. So these things get missed out. So prioritizing the external attack surface. So as I kind of mentioned already, this we're focusing on that because this is like a high traffic area, a lot more uh, risk of being exploited. So internet exposed, and it's internet exposed and highly accessible to threat actors. Internet exposed services and protocols are are possible risks depending on the protocols. Uh, penetration testing at not high enough frequency is not enough, you know, because you some companies are doing it once or twice a year, just doing the minimum uh, that. PCI DSS is requiring, and so the, some of the reoccurring vulnerability scans are not enough. So, you know, you may, may be scanning, doing vulnerability scans monthly, pen testing once or twice a year. You know, this is typically not enough. So, you're the, the attackers are not stopping; they're constantly scanning you. They're going out to see what's showing up on Shodan, the latest vulnerability, and going out and seeing if they can find sites vulnerable to that, so they can exploit it. So, this is constantly ongoing. So, you really need to kind of keep up with what try to keep up with what the threat actors are, are, are trying to trying to do so just kind of cover some of these our, our main focus is apis but definitely worth mentioning some of the risky exposed services and protocols just like remote desktop you really don't want this exposed to the internet there's better ways using vpns to access your internal environments and a lot of the you, you know most of the microsoft protocols you don't want uh exposed to the internet and, it's, and some of these SMB protocols are also not limited to Windows. Uh, Linux and Unix operating systems use these protocols as well. And then your clear text protocols like HTTP and FTP, Telnet, those type of things that are kind of risky because, you know, uh, just speaking with someone recently here that was talking about one of the pen tests they did, I think it was actually Joe talking about that someone was using VNC, and, and this might have been, this was an internal pen test, but they're using VNC logged in as domain admin, someone with an unauthenticated system, so it's easy to get a hold of that and you get access. So you see some of these things externally too. So some of the things that we've seen on our platform at Psycognito, we've seen PLCs for ICS environments exposed to the internet. So anyone that could access the browser could shut down, you know, whatever manufacturing, could be water treatment plants or whatever, get access to that. So these protocols and different things, even going back to not only the protocols, but uh, S3 buckets are exposed, different storage that exposed online. We want to make sure that these are, these are being, uh, you know, not exposed to make sure we're protecting those. Because a lot of cases, misconfigurations happen just because it's in the cloud doesn't mean it's more secure. A lot of people think that. And some people have moved to the cloud just thinking to be more secure. So we want to make sure that we're watching for these exposures that only protocols and ports that are open that you're actually needing and not uh, overexposing things that would allow someone to, to lead to a breach. And another thing too at the risks is you see companies, they may be using microservices to run uh, marketing campaigns for you know some uh, adver ads that marketing's doing and they don't go take those down afterwards. Another example I had a friend that had a uh, a project. He was doing some pen testing for a university. All the web development students had a website while they were there. They built these websites, did their their application or website, and left it up. No one took it down. So you have all these assets out there. They're not being updated regularly. Uh, they're not being pen tested out there. Vulnerable. Just and finally, the university realized, yeah, we need to start taking these offline. So they didn't have an idea of their attack surface. 
So they had to have a pen test performed to try to find these websites so they could be shut down to secure their environment. So risky API exposures. So what is a web API? So those of you that don't, don't know, figure most of you do, API stands for application programming interface. Uh, we're talking more specifically about web APIs here. I mean, you could expose other APIs, but more commonly, you're going to see the web APIs. And this is starting to get a lot more attention uh, because I, I would say API security is now where cloud was about three or four, three to five years ago. People are starting to get more aware of it. There's better resources on API security out there. Uh, it was kind of interesting because, you know, that's been around quite a while. The first, first API pen test I did was probably back in like 2014. So it's been around for a while, but it, even back then, there weren't good pen testing resources or security resources around that. So a browser API can be extend, can extend the functionality of, of a web browser. A uh, server API can extend the functionality of a web server. And so I got this reference from w3schools.com. They've got a lot of good information out there. If you're just getting into web app pen testing and learning more about just how web applications and, and web servers function in general, it's a, a good resource. So risky API exposure, so insecure APIs. And then also going back to the theme here is the, the unintentionally exposed APIs. Maybe you have an API that's only needed internally and maybe you're not securing it properly. You see some companies that may have like whole IP subnet classes in their organization that's externally routed. And you see a lot of this in colleges. Uh, a college I taught at used to have like, I forget if they had a class B or class C, forget what class subnet they had, that was externally routed to the internet. So if you don't have your firewall rule set up in place, then it's going to make it a lot easier for an attacker to get a foothold if they, they're able to, to breach any of these assets. So addressing EASM gaps, external attack service management, so reconnaissance, including OSINT, uh, which is short for open source intelligence. And one of the things I've seen kind of over the industry over the years, and there's a lot of good classes out there that address that, address this but the narrow scope pen tests have brought the weakness i think a lot of pen testers aren't really that highly skilled no scent because you have a thousand ip addresses you're testing it they go into scanning those ips and they're not doing things like shodan or using other tools out there to discover assets they're just focusing on those known ip addresses so they're missing things i mean i've done uh black box pen tests that were you know from the internet i was able to find all the IP blocks, domain names. Uh, we, only knew, we only had the physical address of the company since physical security was involved with doing a physical assessment. But after I did found all the network blocks, IP addresses and all that, doing my scanning, I ran Shodan and found an FTP server in Indonesia that was not in any of those blocks. So this is clear text, FTP exposed to the internet. And if I hadn't done OSINT, we never, would have never found the FTP server. So this is something that could be exploited. So. This is one of the major gaps here. You know, it's there are people are doing the reconnaissance, but they're not really doing the OSINT piece. So a lot of times you're missing out on things by not doing that. So external attack service management discovery. So kind of what you're wanting to do here is collect all the known IP addresses and domain names and perform a reconnaissance against those. And kind of the steps on the reconnaissance collection, the IP address discovery, looking for the autonomous system numbers, uh, using regional registrars like Aaron and Ripe to find those IP blocks, uh, subdomain enumeration using tools like Subfinder, uh, OWASP, Amass. And this, this, these resources was taken from Jason Haddock's talk of the bug bounty, the bug hunter, bug hunters methodology, which if you go on YouTube, you can find the video of it. And there's several versions of the slides out there. This was originally going to be a methodology talk on bug bounty, but the, the reconnaissance piece got so big that the talk is mainly focused on that. So uh, open source intelligence resources out there, you can use a Shodan to locate unknown hosts and then Crunchbase for your mergers and acquisitions. So one thing that companies are dealing with, especially some of these big banks, they're constantly acquiring or selling off companies and sometimes they don't know what assets they have. They may acquire a bank that may not know all the assets they have. And so for mergers and acquisition information, if you're going to acquire a company, this is important to know because you may be inheriting a lot, inheriting a lot of risk. So these are some of the, the, the uh, resources out there. And kind of when I first joined my company and started digging in, learning more about the product, I've seen a lot of things that were kind of 
uh, things that the bug bounty community had seen for a while, doing the reconnaissance, using OSINT to really dig in and find some of these vulnerabilities because in bug bounty, they're finding stuff because uh, through OSINT, this normally being missed by traditional pen testing by performing proper OSINT. And so the re reconnaissance scanning, so you're scanning the IP addresses and domain names, including subdomains, using NMAP to find live hosts, uh, also going further with NMAP, doing port and service scan to identify the web services. And since we're focusing on ABI, API, we're not really getting into the other, but when you're managing your external attack surface, you want to look for other protocols, but this talk is mainly focused on API. So this is where we're focusing on on finding the, the different services or web services where you would locate these APIs. So API endpoint discovery. So API enumeration tools, Kite Runner for RESTful API discovery and FPOOF uh, using word-based API discovery. And this is another great bug bounty res researcher that the resource came from, Katie Paxton Fear, uh, also known as uh, Insider PhD. And so this was taken from her talk on uh, titled My API Testing Automated Toolbox. And these are the tools that she used in this. And so API vulnerability testing. So your API vulnerability testing tools, Authorize, which is a burp suite extension for detecting IDOR, uh, Logger++, a multi-threaded logging extension for burp suite, and SQL map for your SQL injection vulnerability testing, and no SQL map for your flat file type databases like uh, MongoDB and NoSQL and that type of stuff. And also, also for your Java web uh, tokens, JW tool, and then Burp Suite using the inter interception proxy and the vulnerability testing tools within that to test for that. And the URL also links back to that video of uh, Katie's on, on YouTube. And so for the API vulnerability testing, the different tools you can use, even a Wasp Zap, a lot of times that gets overlooked, and I think why it kind of doesn't get more attention than what it does is a lot of the people that do stuff content on OWASP Zap is usually more from the AppSec focus and not as much on the offensive security side. So I don't think we're seeing as much pen testing related content on that. So why it's not used quite as much. And it's a free tool, and you can do a lot of the same things that Burp Suite does. So there's an add on for Burp uh, for Zap. That it's the open API add-on, open, and then you got GraphQL add-on, uh, the SOAP add-on, as well as you can import URLs containing. Uh, uh, there's a a tool that imports files containing URLs. This add-on is in uh, in Zap. So here's some links to uh, some facts on how you can use Zap to scan APIs, as well as another article there on uh, scanning APIs with Zap. And so API vulnerability testing, so OWASP with a lot of the web application-based stuff, they've got a lot of good uh, lists out there and projects. So the OWASP API security top 10 and, and their API security project is a good resource to use there. And one of the things, just kind of a tip on web application vulnerability testing is going beyond the, the OWASP top 10 using like the different testing guides. Uh, one of the things doing the podcast on the the hacker factory podcast uh i had uh try to remember who it was it was either i believe it might have been john jackson was talking about or actually i think uh but anyway there was a really good point and they said testing beyond the owas top 10 because because it's an owas top 10 means it's popular now that what they're mostly seeing it doesn't mean the, that there's not other vulnerabilities outside that so you want to make sure you're you're testing for that and actually, I think it might have been Tiberius that said testing past the OWASP top 10. So addressing the gaps with external attack surface management. So, you know, you've done your pen testing, you're doing your reoccurring vulnerability scanning, but you want to make sure you're constantly monitoring your external attack surface. So you're doing, you know, continuous discovery, achieve and maintain a more accurate asset inventory. So this is going to be constantly contracting and expanding you may temporarily put up infrastructure, applications may be decommissioned, new ones can be brought on board, you know, there's problems with shadow IT, things get spun up that you're not aware of, and with cloud that makes it easier, so keeping up with an accurate inventory. And this is like doing continuous discovery. And so continuous testing along with your vulnerability scanning, your pen testing, using like external attack surface management platforms, 
and, and building in some automation, because that's one of the things bug bounty hunters do, is they're really good with the automation piece. So they're constantly finding things. So they, when they start a new bug bounty, they'll put new domains and subdomains in there. These bug bounties they've joined, let that scan, and then they go back and do further testing. So adding in some automation helps with that. So that improves the scalability and resource limitations, improves consistency. And it was kind of interesting. We spoke with a, a, a potential customer a while back, and they were talking about when they perform OSINT on a target that they spend like eight hours on one target. So trying to scale that across tens, hundreds, or thousands of targets, you just don't have enough time doing that. And so one of the things I see too, uh, you hear everyone trying to replace pen testing with automation. I don't think we're at that space, but I think there's ways that we can leverage automation in some of these other platforms to help pen testers. Even with some of these exter external attack service management platforms, you can do these scans, collect all the information on vulnerabilities, that shows you where to focus your time and you spend more of your time doing the fun stuff, doing the actual hacking, uh, seeing if you can do any actual exploitation or post-exploitation activities. So this kind of frees up pen testers to do more with their time. And external tax source management, whether you're automating yourself or using these platforms, it's able to you know help free up time, do uh, more with the resources you have, and, and just kind of help you maintain and monitor that, that platform, your external attack surface, uh, you know, before the, the bad guys can get there. And it's kind of something that you have going on between your, your pen testing. Cause you know, pen testing, if you're doing it, you know, quarterly, annually, biannually. So that way you got something going on as it's going along. So some references and resources, uh, I actually did a, a uh, article for U.S. Cybersecurity Magazine based on this topic, and there's some of the resources in there, uh, but you can find that on U.S. Cybersecurity uh, Magazine, and also the reconnaissance reference to Jason Haddock's Bug Hunter's methodology. So that I definitely recommend checking out. Katie Paxton's fears resources I've mentioned, and Corey Ball came out with a great resource earlier this year, hacking APIs. So a lot of these resources, he actually shows you how to pen test these resources. So I highly recommend that. And around DEF CON, he also released some free training that I think you can find out there on YouTube on API pen test training. So that, that's a really good, good one to get started with. And also Alyssa Knight has some really good content on uh, API pen testing out there too. And that concludes my talk. We can open it up to questions and there are the links to contact with me, contact contact me on uh i'm on twitter uh linkedin and in my uh if you go to my website the hacker factory you can find links to youtube channels and all that other stuff and uh the the last url there is to my podcast which is available on all the popular podcast platforms so anyone have any questions yes Yeah, like in the in the, the book, the hacking APIs. That's a good 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 place there to look as well. So that's a good resource. Uh, Alyssa Knight has some good resources as well as I'd mentioned. And one of the things too, as far as uh, they don't have an APIs, but a good also looking back as far as a general web app pen testing resource is the the uh, testing guide through or actually the the web application hackers handbook. In their book, they have their testing methodology in there, their checklist, as well as now, if you go to Port Swigger Web Application Security Academy, they've moved that book online and they've got a good testing methodology. I know some of the different bug bounty companies, they combined using uh, the OWASP, I mean, the OWASP testing guides along with the Web Application uh, Hacker's Handbook resource, which is also part of Port Swigger. And you can find those resources on there on how to test, how to test those. But. That's it. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, the bear. <laughs> he didn't take me down. He took everyone else down, which is kind of interesting because uh, it's kind of funny because you see in the picture, the bear has his front leg around my leg trying to take me down. So the, the people that wrestled the bear before me, he actually took them down. But at least I got past that. 
it's kind of funny because uh I won a t-shirt that uh said I wrestled Samson and the bear and I lost. That's when I know which time I wrestled the bear because I switched into that shirt. So that's the second time I wrestled the bear. And also that was I was drunk in that picture. I I won a bar tab for doing the best against the bear. And so uh I wasn't gonna wrestle the bear again because it's just so difficult. I thought, man, that's impossible. I won't do that again. So the owner of the nightclub come around later on and I was already through that bar tab. And so he came up and so said, we wrestled the bear again? Sure. So I went up there and wrestled the bear again. So yeah. So yeah, I definitely didn't win it, but it's an interesting experience. It's, it's something I don't think PETA would allow anymore. I don't think they probably allow bear wrestling. And even back then, some of the, some of the laws and stuff, you had to let the bear rest so much. I don't know, maybe it was the bear wrestling union or something that you had to let the bear rest so much between times. But yeah, <laughs> pretty interesting story that was actually kind of funny. And I don't know why it would be useful, but you see the referee in the picture, but there's a guy behind him that the bear is on a chain. So he has the bear by a chain. So I don't know what that's going to do. If the bear got mad and decided to come after you, I don't think he's going to stop the bear. So <laughs> any other questions? And if anyone has anything after this, feel free to reach out to me and even anything career advice, anything outside that. So thank you.